It's wonderful to be back here. Um, I was here last year, and so I'd really like to thank the Africa Film Festival and all the supporters who make the festival possible. The central idea that I will be putting forward is that, in my opinion, the images we see of African women are often filtered. And I think this is something that Ashika alluded to when she spoke about the power relations that are involved in producing these images. So I'm just going to elaborate a little on that. And this is why it was so wonderful to see Liz's work, where we are beginning to see these unfiltered images. Or shall I say, less filtered images. I think, Liz, you're smiling. <laughs> you have an idea of what I'm talking about there. But I think that's going to make for a great discussion. Um, so this slide here is about a project that I've been working on for several years. AWFH stands for the African Women Filmmakers Hub. And those who were here last year, um, you remember I spoke about this, but please don't get up and walk out. I have something new to say about it. <laughs> However, before I get to that, I'm going to try to go back to a video. And I want to play this video without any introduction. And then I would like to ask you maybe some questions after you've seen it. It's very, very short. When I was 23 years old, uh, my first marriage had failed. And then I won one from that marriage. So I was working as a sales agent. I was invited to a sporting activity, Kumaris Depot. I met this other guy. I was in company of my daughter. She was around two years. But I'm going to run away. So I'm going to sing Ghana. But I'm going to change numbers, just like the normal way. So we went to canteen in Kwacho. But I'm just going to if you don't mind, in the room, can we have lunch? Can we have lunch? But I don't mind. It was a very, very small room. So he had jumped on me, and that was the rap. I couldn't scream. The room was so tiny. Ugh. I cannot explain how it happened because it happened so fast. I could have reported him. The first question they would you go and go and I was in Ghana. What did you expect when the umbakum kumana? Then I missed my period. The same week was supposed to be my younger man did something. The katanga ko I've been raped. I had no one to share with. No one got angry. I could have followed up on him. No one that moved. I've had this kind of battery. I've tried to use my med, my traditional medicines, and it didn't work. So I remember my mother going there, but I'm going to go to raise my wife because I'm happily married. No one that's when I'm going to go clinic. There's no broken. I'm going to make her go. She couldn't handle it. My uncle, she's very short tempered. And the Simona and Gahukara, Ega, and the Dandani, what my responsibility is, even at two. Dandam faint. The tickets are down. You know, my saloon, which thing is, I should get a market in Ivana, Mamanagusana, Lupin Gasitos and Internet. I know better. I've had the photo for two years. I'm going to get a rough foot in Jumet and Guzo Vendez also. I'm thinking so, my name. My son and my police are one of them. I grade one. Beth has got a man. My school fees are not bad. The better school fees in the ruler, my uncle. And the end of the show, I told Kutish and Dawea in Dawea for sex. I was trying to I'm not a man to sell copy. No, I'm not a man to sell copy. 
There was a point they would teach Kuru Jafar. When it wrote him, I'm sorry, I did a report book. Wasn't covered the report book when I was at my patron school fees. The fending shrunk to one is an animal police. Mono was a tango to my number one, each each in the Vatango one, Vatango, but a rosco fees. But it's too much you maintain in the eight on one eats. The other day, 2010, I was a phone number I was a phone number and I was a phone number. 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 I tried everything possible. Go abroad. But it's a lamp. I'd like to find out, I'd like to ask, um, does that little video feel different from other stories you've heard and seen about African women? Any others? Anybody? No. 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 Okay. I kind of feel it does, in a way. African women from the continent. I think if you're working off the continent, um, it's different. Generally, the content that I see in a gathering that, in a European setting is more like a news report you know, where you don't get that intimacy with people. You know, you might have a white camera person who's there. You will often have a group of women, not so often one woman who's telling her story. And uh, you will also have, um, you, you often will have other men around, and this subtly affects how the women can relate to you. And in fact, um, when we were doing this, you'll see that it was done by an all-female crew. This is the work that I've been doing since 1998. And we have got to the point where in Zimbabwe, just from our own circles, we can get an all-female crew. But it has been 30 years of work. And we almost didn't have a DOP, because you'll often find that the women are not doing technical work. So what happened is I had to actually jump in and Debbie was a DOP. So that's really exciting. But um, what, what my response to this is that people have used the word heart-wrenching, which for me is a, difficult, a different response from awful, terrible. For me, it shows that there is another level of barrier that has been broken down. When something is terrible and awful, it is that awful thing over there. When it is heart-wrenching, it is heart-wrenching here. And so I think these are some of the reasons why we have to capacitate women filmmakers to tell their stories. Um, because as Liz's presentation said, you can remember it better than I can, it was and Lester, your first slide about the lion and the hunter. Yeah, the hunter never tells a lion story. So I started my career like three years ago, uh, 30 years ago. 2005, I have a film that's in the competition in Sundance. You'd think that I would have been one of those people on those posters. What is stopping? African women from coming from this level of entry to the level where we have these sustainable ecosystems that Liz was talking about. Well, there are lots of things. Um, Laura Mulvey, who was a film theorist in the 1970s, started speaking about how gender works in film. How the differences in society that are based on gender 
are reflected in the film narrative so that women are generally in traditional film not seen as agents, they're not protagonists. This refers back to what Gita was saying, that they're the second or third role, they're so seldom the first role. So uh, Laura Malvi began to theorize this. I was a film student in Germany when I began to engage. And I thought to myself, well, you know, there's something else working here. How can I use Laura Malby's theory to explain what I am seeing? What was I seeing? Well, I really started talking about, thinking about this really seriously when we had an exercise to do a reportage at film school and two things happened might not have been the same reportage, so maybe I'm combining two things here. But one of the things was that uh, we had a, a, a person who was interested in doing his reportage on a basketball team. And I'd been in Germany for a while, this was in the early 90s, there were not as many people of color um, from my part of the world in Germany as there are now. So I was delighted to see, oh, there is a person of color, a black man in this basketball team. So I'm thinking, good, I'm going to get a really good look at this person. And then I realized that every time the black person came into the picture, the director cut and went on to talk about something else. And I was thinking, oh, so what I am being told here is that this black body, even though it is male, is not worthy of being included in the narrative. It has no value to this narrative. And I began to think of what Laura Mulvey had been saying, that women do not have value in the narrative. But in a way, you can say that women have some kind of value, even if it's not the value they want, because they are there to be desired by the man. But this black male body was actually being cut out. So that's when I realized that it's not just gender that works as a category of exclusion from the narrative. It is all categories of difference. And then race is one of them. So when you start combining race and gender, you can see that African women, black women, are falling lower and lower. And the interesting thing is that as much as film reflects what is going on in society, it also reflects the mechanisms by which film is made. So the very people that you will see who are acting and who are the protagonists and whose stories are being told in film are the very people who are making those films. So um, I wrote an op-ed piece for an online platform which will be published shortly. It's a South African one. And um, I just wanted to read a little bit about uh, this issue of women in film and then how other categories of difference also affect how women are portrayed in film and how different kinds of women are also portrayed in film. Women in film paralleling society are not constructed as acting, achieving, power-wielding subjects. This on-screen reality harshly reflects the realities of the filmmaking industry, where women make up less than 10% of film directors and less than 15% of screenwriters. Other social systems by which people are excluded or included are also represented in film. Race, class, age and nationality, political affiliation, are examples of these other categories of difference. These categories are today's demographic characteristics, what we call demographics for short. A person's demographics determine whether or not a person is able 
to access the means of filmmaking. Where competence is held equal, a man is more likely than a woman to do so, that is to access the resources. A white woman is more likely than a black woman. We only have to think of the Me Too movement here, who have been the protagonists in the Me Too movement. I think we heard one voice from um, Lupita Nyong'o, but otherwise most of the protagonists of the Me Too movement have been from a different demographic to Lupita's. A younger woman is more likely than an older woman. And here, the Lupita example is evidence of how that is. In this case, we have a younger black woman able to stand up and narrate her ordeal. A woman affiliated to some political power in some way is more likely than a woman who is not affiliated to political power. And this issue of political power is really insidious because you will find that, especially on our continent, if you grow up in a family with power, you are exposed to so many privileges. So by the time that you are an adult, um, you have a lot of privilege to stand on to help your access. For African women filmmakers, this political power might be ruling party power, or it might be international community power. So either you're in with the right party or the right group of international people like you. <laughs> and if you don't, well, it becomes a bit difficult. Whatever it is, the intersections of multiple exclusions is particularly toxic to African women filmmakers. In fact, African women, especially sub-Saharan African women, lag far behind other categories of women when it comes to representing themselves and their points of view in films. A survey carried out by the International Images Film Festival for Women, IIFFF, which is uh, the festival I founded in Harare in 2003, which is an annual Harare-based woman-centered film festival, which screens films that feature a female protagonist, reveal that in the period 2013 to 2017, in its programming, only 17% of documentaries with a running time of 45 minutes or longer were made by African women. Only 14% of fiction films with a running time of 45 minutes or longer that were screened in that same period were made by African women. And this is a festival by African women for African women in the first um, instance that is actually located on the continent. And still, it was hard work to find those um, films that were made by African women. And on purpose, I chose that criterion of 45 minutes or longer, because the longer the film, the more you're going into feature length, the more economically sustainable it is. You can make your three minute and like the three minute that we saw here, or some of the clips that we saw from Liz with minimal resources. But in terms of sustainability, there is also minimal sustainability. Who gets to see them? Is it the people who will say, oh, okay, we, we'd like to talk to that person about their next project? No. That happens when you've been able to graduate to your, to, um, your feature link present, um, productions. And then, of course, there's also the difference between documentary and fiction, which is why you see that the figure for documentary making was slightly higher at 17%. It requires less resources. And, and yeah, basically all kinds of resources, money, equipment, people trusting in you and being willing to help you. So um, this means that people are talking today about more and more African women being in the film industry, but at what level are they there? 
are we there at the informal level, uh, similar to the vending woman that we were talking about there? Or are we there at the level that Liz is talking about, where we want to create sustainable ecosystems, where we can sustain our livelihoods out of it? Um, and then one of the last things that I would like to mention is that um, your nationality also plays a large role in determining whether an African woman can access the resources necessary for filmmaking. North African women filmmakers have higher chances of accessing the resources they need than do other African women. Many North African countries have flourishing industries. The cinema of Egypt is one of the oldest in the world. In sub-Saharan Africa, women making films in Francophone countries are able to tap into Francophone resources designated to support the use of the French language on the planet. And this is what we actually saw in Guido's introduction, that most of those women were uh, Francophone women, Belgium being also a Francophone country. And uh, I think, yes, uh, the ties, the historical ties, mean that if you are Francophone, you are likely to access some, um, and some support through that channel. Anglophone female African filmmakers are best placed if they are resident in South Africa, Nigeria, or Kenya. Liz, do you agree? Oh, good. <laughs> Countries where governments have committed to including the film industry in national development planning. Yes, and of course, the involvement of government is clear. To represent, to have the power to represent to have the power to reproduce any way. It is an act of power. And so when we represent the world in film, that film itself becomes a location of power. So clearly, those people who have control on power want to keep that uh, control on it and do not want to allow this power into the hands of people that they are not sympathetic to, probably because they feel that these filmmakers are not sympathetic to them. So what do you do in that case? You keep going. I was telling Mika that uh, a little while ago said to me, to see you're like a pit bull, which I take as a compliment. <laughs> so um, we started this African Women Filmmakers Hub, which, uh, I spoke about last year, but which I have since refined. It's a pan-African initiative for capacity building of African women filmmakers with an emphasis on new voices and on providing a career path for African women filmmakers whose expressions and careers have stagnated due to constellations of power in the film industry on the continent and globally. You're having a gone through my career, which began in the late 80s, when I uh, worked on several films for a white man from the United States, uh, I realized that it wouldn't make sense if people like me have been through that and have not done anything to make sure that it doesn't happen to other people. So just there again, uh, what we do, so uh, to break it down a bit more, networking, you can see the women at the top there, the training that's uh, in my garden at home, an impromptu training session, mm -hmm. and uh, a more formal training session down below, um, which was a workshop in Kenya. Uh, I think that was done in 2017. One of our other sites of networking, I've incorporated the festival so that uh, it becomes the central point, productions, training. I like to do uh, on-the-job training. I like to always have a production come out of any workshop that I do because then immediately people can take this and say, yes, I did this, I was the sound person, etc. So um, in our pilot program, we were able to do this production. Um, yes, you're, you're wondering where the women are. <laughs> There are three women behind the camera. You know, that's the situation we want to change. This was shot in 2016, now in 2018. 
we had an all-female all crew. Okay, it, it, it wasn't live action, but it's still progress. And uh, uh, we want to do numbers of productions in a five-year plan that I have a, um, a proposal for. We want to do at least two long fiction, two long documentaries, and then 10 short additional fiction uh, films per year, in addition to the workshop films that I've just mentioned. And the idea is to build up a critical mass of women who can uh, operate at a competitive level on the continent. So Nena is the first long fiction feature that we want to do, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, here are some of the mentees. This lady in the middle is the lady I've now worked on, on the script of Nena. There were two other young Nigerians. Um, uh, and then she came, the, the other two ladies wrote the treatment and she came in and wrote two versions of the actual script with me, a uh, script doctoring for her. And I have at least one young lady from Kenya that I'm still working with. And um, yes, these are the milestones. We had our inaugural meeting in 2016 in Harare. That short film was completed. We had some post-production boot camps and a pre-production workshop um, in Kenya. Um, and we had a, a residency in Dakar in 2017, which was feature film. And I'm still mentoring about five of those people. Uh, the, the mentoring is now completely unpaid. It was just that we had three weeks. You know, normally for a script writing course, you need at least three months going into six months, but we had to pack it into three weeks. So I thought, I can't just leave these people um, halfway through or haven't just started. That's our logo. Um, we, we have a constitution, and this is how we want to to administer, to create national hubs, starting with partners that we've been working with, and then they will consolidate into regional hubs. And uh, they will then all elect an executive committee. Some of the people that I've been expending energy in order to interest them in this project have said things like, oh, there are too many Zimbabweans who are spearheading this project because, as I said, you know, it's not the preferred location which should be South Africa or Nigeria or Kenya. <laughs> but even so, uh, we have 12 countries reached so far. We have people on the ground in these 12 countries and we can go into these countries at any time and uh, do work there. Some of them we have already been working in Ke uh, Kenya, Senegal, Uganda. So, Nena, this is our, the film that we are working on, which I've been working on for some years now. It came from another project. It didn't only begin uh, with the AWFH. It came from another project, which came out of having been on the jury at FESPAPO in 2015. And uh, one of the things that became clear to us, the, uh, the grand jury members in 2015, was that the quality of storytelling is decreasing. And uh, we thought that this had a lot to do with the ease of making films. The easier it is to make a film, the less you have to deliberate in order to make it. And so there was a call for really investing in script development. So I was thinking, how can we do this? Because it, it's a twofold pro a problem now when you're screenwriting. First of all, you have to get your story. And then you have got to structure your story into a film. So I thought that, well, if we can get novels and adapt them, novels that are suitable for adaptation, we at least we've done the first thing, which is the story. And then all we have to do is structure it. So I began a program called Adapt to be Seen, which didn't see the light of day. Uh, so then I took one of the films into the AWFH because it was about uh, this young lady, Nena, who lives in this family where no one discusses sex. Okay, women of African heritage from the continent, how many of you came from families where people discuss sex? Hands up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you know, whenever I've spoken to people, they said, Oh, that's my story entirely. 
and uh, so it seemed like this was a, a good candidate to, and um, so that's Ife Sinachi who co-wrote the script with me and this is one of the young ladies we are considering to, to be the director. So what we've done with that project so far, option secured, script developed, etc. Uh, the crewing is already in progress. I'll be going on my first recce to Lagos in, uh, in October and our fundraising is in progress. Unfortunately, um, again, you know, the issue is who, who cares about a young girl who's at school and having to go through uh, managing things like menstruation and relationship with boys. And so um, it, it, it's an uphill, it's an uphill uh, struggle, but one just has to remain committed. And so this is what I'm saying things are filtered. This kind of story, which would work to empower millions of young women on the continent, is something that is filtered out. Because even if there is money for, let's say, uh, what do they call it, so, uh, sexual and reproductive rights, okay? It's got to be about these little people in this little village who have no access to pads whatsoever. But it's when the African women themselves are coming forward and saying, this is a story that we need to tell in order to empower ourselves. Those people who are doing the empowering have a different point of view. So these are the many filters that are working to filter us out. Even when you see the three minute that we did, that was uh, because the Urgent Action Fund gave us money specifically for sexual violence against vendors because this was the time when the police were on the streets in Zimbabwe and a lot of vendors were um, being sexually abused by the police. And I think you might have seen earlier in the year, I think there was that report on Sky News where there were about 17 Zimbabwean women together. They were always like holding hands like this. Um, so, but the actual source of that script was the women in the creative industries themselves saying, look, we can't get ahead because we are being sexually abused right, left and center. And for us to be able to go out there and represent who we are to the world, we want this to stop and we want to start naming in the sense of the Me Too movement. But the Me Too movement is good for Hollywood. It's not good for Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, we're talking development, so it's got to be vendors who are being abused by the police. So while it was so wonderful that we had that opportunity as women to come forth and commune over this filmmaking process with the women who are engaged, there's one other spot. Um, there is still filtering going on from the various power uh, systems in the world. And so I'm really grateful to the Africa Film Festival for availing this platform where we can talk about such things. Because I think it's by talking about such things that we can develop our action plans and work to change it. If anyone is interested in NENA, I have some brochures here which will also give you the link to our crowdfunding platform. Thank you very much. Thank you.